So uh, hello everybody and uh, thank you for signing up and um, coming along to this webinar today uh, which will cover a new uh, inversion workflow uh, called One Dimensional Stochastic Inversion uh, and cover the Petrel implementation uh, through the plugin that we've built. Um, so the agenda for the webinar, um, Mr. Patrick Connolly who sat here with me is going to uh, run through the Odyssey introduction and theory. Uh, I will then take you through uh, a demo in Petrel. Then we'll, um, Pat will come back online and talk through uh, some additional, val additional validation and uh, summary around the Odyssey workflow. And then we'll have time for some Q&A at the end of the session. So as we're going along, if you have any questions, um, please uh, submit them through the, uh, the question dialogue, uh, which is in the GoToMeeting panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so without further ado, I shall hand over to Pat um, to talk you through the Odyssey uh, introduction and theory. Good morning or good afternoon everybody. Uh, this is Pat Connolly and I'm going to talk to you about Odyssey. Uh, Odyssey um, is a new approach to seismic inversion. It was initially developed by BP and BP took the decision after the first phase of the project to commercialize it uh, and also to fully publish it. So there's a full publication on everything we're talking about here available in the current edition of Geophysics and the reference is given there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, BP put the commercialization out to tender and uh, that tender process was, uh, was won by Seagal uh, who have now completed uh, the, um, that project and the, the uh, product is now available. So Odyssey is a uh, joint FASCIES uh, inversion uh, estimation process. Um, it will estimate uh, reservoir properties and impedances together and all their associated uncertainties. And it does this by matching the seismic to very large numbers of pseudo wells and it does that simultaneously to multiple angle stacks. This slide provides an overview of the process. Uh, we start with seismic data on the top left, in this case color inverted angle stacks. And the process works one trace at a time. And at, at that particular trace location, it will generate several thousand pseudo wells, each of which have been tailored for that precise location in space. For each pseudo well, we generate a synthetic, and the synthetics are matched to the seismic trace. The synthetics which best match, typically about 30 from those two or 3,000, will be selected. Each pseudo well comprises a complete suite of uh, petrophysical curves. Um, so we can select the particular curve of interest, and the example shown here is the V-shale curve. Uh, so we can select the corresponding set of best match V-shale curves and average them um, to produce an estimate of the reservoir property at that location. And because we're averaging a, a number of uh, V-shell curves, we also get an estimate of the uncertainty of that as well. Um, we proceed trace by trace, uh, generating two new volumes, in this case of the mean and standard deviation of the net to gross. Inversion is usually applied to seismic data from the late appraisal stage onwards, um, by which time we tend to have um, quite a lot of prior knowledge about our reservoir. We'll typically have a pretty good understanding of the depositional environment, the stratigraphy, and um, we'll have some well logs providing rock property relationships um, and some depth trends. We can measure vertical statistics in the well logs, and we'll probably have some information about the fluid contacts. And for any inversion process, ideally we'd like to make full use of all of this information and integrate it all together within the, uh, within the inversion. The real challenge is how we bring together such a disparate uh, quantity of, of information within one inversion package. And the way that Odyssey does this um, is to generate pseudo wells which are fully consistent with all our prior knowledge. Each pseudo well comprises a full suite of petrophysical curves, so very much like a real well. Um, therefore that's why we call them uh, pseudo wells. They're each calibrated to real well data. Uh, we use a sophisticated model for the vertical statistics. And, uh, and a rock physics model um, to build up a full suite of, of curves. And the, the range of properties within the pseudo wells is constrained by our prior expectations of, uh, of the reservoir. 
Um, and the quality of the result, of course, is very much dependent on the quality of the pseudo wells. So a lot of effort is put into making these pseudo wells as uh, geologically realistic as possible. Pseudo wells are built up from a number of macro layers which are tied to the interpretation. So depending on the complexity of the reservoir, there may be anything from say a minimum of three macro layers up to six, seven, eight, nine, or ten possibly. Um, the prior information um, is parameterized independently um, for each of those macro layers, so we can provide information on our expectation independently for each one of those. Um, for each uh, for each set of pseudo wells, we, we because the, uh, the the interpretation is varying spatially, uh, we have to build a new set of pseudo wells for each location, so it's consistent with the interpretation, which defines the macro layers of that particular location. And we find that we typically need to build somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 pseudo wells per trace to obtain good results. Macro layers are then populated by micro layers. Each micro layer consists of a single lithofascies. Now the vertical distribution um, of the micro layers uh, is determined um, by a continuous time Markov chain model. And that's based around a transition probability matrix, which determines the probability uh, of which microlayer will be coming next. And the thickness of that microlayer is taken from an exponential distribution of bed thicknesses. Um, the, this is a, a geologically uh, very realistic distribution, which is typically found in, uh, in many deposition environments. So we're building up a, a vertical distribution which is consistent with the geology. Um, and this model also allows us to provide a lot of close control on the proportions of lithofascies that we, we're going to encounter in the reservoir and, and hence which we need to represent in the population of pseudo wells. Um, so we could, by changing the parameterization or varying the parameterization of the uh, of the exponential distributions, we can vary the proportions of, uh, of different lithofascies. <clears throat> so the pseudo, the pseudo well have a deterministic and a stochastic element. The macro layers are determined deterministically based on time to interpretation, but the population within the macro layers, the micro layering, uh, are stochastic. Uh, also, so will be random and vary from my pseudo well to pseudo well. The modeling of the pseudo wells starts with uh, a lithofascies column, uh, constructed as, I, as I've just described. Then each lithofascies is modeled separately, uh, based on a rock physics model calibrated to well data and use, making use of any appropriate generic models. So for SANS, for example, we first define a porosity depth trend. Um, and then we def define the correlation between porosity and the dry frame and shear moduli. We take into account all the variability and the uncertainties of these correlations, which are represented by variations within the uh, population of the pseudo wells. Uh, this allows us to build up a set of elastic properties for the full set of, uh, of sands, in this case, for each pseudo well. We then use these to perform fluid substitution based either on deterministic or stochastic fluid contacts. Similarly for the shales, we start with a VP depth trend um, calibrated to our real well data, and we also define VPVS and VP density transforms based on the correlations. We apply appropriate mixing laws to combine sands and shales for shady sands, and other lithofascies are introduced and modeled uh, in a similar way. So we're therefore building up for each pseudo well a complete set of, of reservoir property and elastic properties um, for the entire column. So the final result is a pseudo well with a complete set of curves. Um, our aim was to make these as geologically realistic as we possibly could. Um, so the pseudo well is consistent with all prior information, tailored to ex exact 3D location. Uh, and the modeling is made to be geologically realistic. So we used to test this in BP by showing pseudo wells and real wells to geologists and seeing if they could pick out which were real and which were not. And uh, when it got to the point they couldn't tell the difference, um, we figured we were doing a pretty good job. We now proceed to the matching step. Uh, so the process is entirely one-dimensional. 
Uh, it only operates on one individual trace at a time, uh, and it is not influenced by the results of any uh, surrounding traces. For each pseudo L, uh, we generate a synthetic, uh, which is tailored to match the seismic data uh, that we have. So it will have the appropriate seismic wavelet, and it will be generated using extended elastic impedance with the appropriate chi angle, again, to match the seismic data we're working with. Uh, all the pseudo wells are matched with the seismic data, and we select typically the best 30 um, to um, proceed onto the averaging process. Uh, each macro layers are matched independently, and uh, the best ones are then reconstituted reconstitu to form the best matched pseudo wells. The uh, figure on the right shows an example of the process. So if you look on the, the bottom figure, the left hand trace is the seismic trace. And then on the right are 20 of the best matched pseudo wells, showing the quality of the match to the uh, real seismic trace. The second trace in is the average of those best matched pseudo wells, which shows the, the, uh, the quality of the, uh, of the model that we have to match the seismic data. Um, and because each pseudo well has a complete suite of curves, we can then select the property of interest and average the curves that correspond to that property. So here we have the corresponding best match V shale curves, and we'll take typically 30 of those and average them all um, to provide a mean and a standard deviation um, of the V shale estimate at that location. I refer to that as the posterior. If we were to sum or average the entire set of pseudo wells, all 2,000 or 3,000 of them, um, we'd obtain the curve seen in the bottom right. So th this is effectively um, represents our prior information that we had for the reservoir. That's, that's what we've defined as being our expectation of what we were going to find. Um, so you'll see it does have some vertical variation of where we expect the high and the low net to growth regions to be, but it will have quite wide uncertainty around that to represent our uncertainty uh, of, of that information. So from going from the prior to the posterior, um, we've shrunk the uncertainty significantly and introduced a lot of detail. And all that information has come from the seismic data. And that's what the seismic data is bringing um, to our um, property estimation process. Um, you'll see that the pseudo wells are generated at high resolution, uh, typically at half a millisecond. So they contain a lot of high frequency information. But in, in the averaging process, because that high, high frequency information is not constrained by the seismic, that will tend to average out. And what we'll be left with is, are the frequencies which are constrained by the seismic data, but also the very low frequencies which are constrained by the, uh, by the low frequency trend information coming back um, from, the, from the rock property, rock physics models that we, we used. So the process works trace by trace. Uh, so this shows an example, uh, input color inverted chi angle stack on the left. And the next one is the, the net to gross mean and the net to gross standard deviation of our property estimate. And on the right hand side is the, uh, the, the average of the pseudo well synthetics, uh, which illustrates the quality of our model, um, how well we've modeled the seismic data. So we can compare that with the input seismic data on the left. And so we've done you know, a pretty good job of modeling our seismic data. Um, I'm now gonna hand back to Mark, who's gonna give you a live demo of the process, and then I'll pick up and, uh, and show some more information about the quality of the results that we obtain. Okay, um, thank you very much, Pat. Uh, so it's my job now to uh, show you through the implementation of the Odyssey uh, inversion workflow um, in Patrol. Um, so just to start with, some inputs and outputs from Odyssey. Um, so on the left, we have a, uh, a color inverted impedance volume at 15 degrees and a color inverted gradient volume. And on the right, we have two um, outputs from Odyssey. So a, uh, a net volume uh, as a percentage and also a probable litho facies volume. Uh, so we can have a look through the inversion, Odyssey inversion workflow now to, um, to understand how these outputs have been derived from these two inputs. So Odyssey is found uh, in our marina environment for Patrol. Um, so it's fully integrated in Patrol, reading and writing only uh, Patrol data. So 
So this is the um, Odyssey interface. So we're going to take a look through these uh, the processes uh, that form the in Odyssey plugin uh, one at a time. Um, so starting with create parameters. Uh, so this has a number of tabs to work through sequentially um, and parameterization uh, should be used as part of an iterative process to tune the configuration and allowing the uh, best match pseudo wells to be, to be optimized. So the inputs um, to Odyssey or the raw inputs, we need our, our well, uh, selection of wells and a datum from which the, the trend lines are derived. Uh, a log suite, so fascias, v-shell as a percentage, porosity, v-pvs and rho. Our moduli logs, um, which can be derived if you don't have them available. Um, our fluid properties and our fluid saturations, uh, defined here, will be carried through the inversion process. And then the cutoffs uh, defined here are used to limit the net fraction um, in the hydrocarbon pore volume calculations. In the lithofacies tab, um, so what I see you can calculate properties for four different lithofacies, clean sand, shaley sand, cemented sand and shale. Um, in this parameter tab, uh, each of the well log fascias must be mapped or assigned to each of the corresponding Odyssey lithofacies. In macro layers, um, we define the uh, macro layers to define to divide uh, the well log for statistical analysis. Um, so here you can see I have uh, five well tops, uh, which give me one, two, three, four macro layers uh, in this particular well. Um, so we, the analysis of the well log data is calculated for the most part um, by a macro layer. Uh, so a few comments on the macro layers in general. Um, they should be used to define intervals which have bed thickness characteristics and vertical statistics different to the intervals above and below. Macro layers should be between 50 and 80 milliseconds thick and macro layer boundaries should fall within shaley intervals on the logs. Um, so the advice here is kind of start simple and you can always increase the complexity later. Uh, if you need to. Um, the TDR tab, uh, so this is just a simple uh, plot um, of the well data between the first and last macro layer uh, plotted in the QC plot with a time depth uh, polynomial uh, drawn over the top. The fluid contacts specified here um, as well tops uh, are just used when creating the QC pseudo wells that allow the initial statistical QC to, to uh, take place. Uh, next, we have a series of uh, trend plots based on the analysis of the well data for the reservoir, the non-reservoir, and the laminated lithofacies. Um, so the trends that we'll see in this series of QC plots will form the basis of how the corresponding pseudo-well log suites are populated within each of the, the lithofacies within each um, pseudo-well. Um, so the first, uh, the first tab, sorry, is reservoir. Um, this allows us to define the trends for the clean sand and the cemented sand. Um, so as Pat mentioned, the first part of the clean sand trend definition is to relate porosity to depth. Um, this is just a simple linear regression. Uh, the next trend to be established um, is the relationship between porosity, dry foam, bulk modulus and shear modulus for the clean sands. So this can be done by uh, choosing either porosity to shear then shear to dry frame or porosity to dry frame and then dry frame to shear. Um, so you define your the trends that you want to carry forward uh, in the plots and then repeat the exercise for the cemented sands. Um, so again, these trends that we see will be carried through as input to creating the logs in the pseudo wells um, for both the clean sand and cemented sand. In the non-reservoir tab, um, a similar analysis is made for um, the shale lithofacies. Um, so to parameterize the shales, we take a VP two-way time trend, uh, VP density, and also a VPVS uh, trend forward. In the laminated tab, uh, this allows us to define the trends for the shaley sand. Um, so this is just a, a linear regression between the two-way time and the porosity uh, observed in the shaley sands for the selected wells. Uh, and appropriate mixing laws are used to combine the shale and sand properties um, for the shaley sands. So moving into the bed thickness analysis. Um, 
So the fascist log that has been provided and mapped to each of the Odyssey lithofishes is automatically analysed with each uh, macro layer. So for each macro layer, the minimum and maximum uh, lithofishes thicknesses, uh, the lambda values, and also the proportion of each lithofacies are calculated directly from the fascist log that's been provided as input. Um, so the bed thickness data and analysis that's stored here um, will control the lithofacies thickness range and distribution uh, within each of the litho columns that are generated in each of the pseudo wells um, against each trace to be inverted. So on the right here we have a, a plot of QC, a series of QC plots displaying um, the bed thickness data. So these are plotted as um, thickness versus a log of the count of thickness for each lithofacies um, in each macro layer. So on each of the plots we can see the lambda line which is this solid line, uh, the minimum and maximum lambda um, ranges which kind of tie onto the, the plots. Um, so these trend line uh, coefficients are stored um, to the left and can be edited and tuned um, as you need to uh, to carry through the process. So the slopes of these lines or the lambda values can be edited. Um, so if you bring this, swing this line to the left, so you have a steeper line, this is going to increase the number of um, thin beds in the litho columns. If you push the line out to the right, um, you're going to increase the uh, number of thicker beds in the, the litho fishes column. So again, this is a, a key component uh, or key part of the analysis that controls the creation of the lithofacies columns, um, which is the kind of start of each pseudo well uh, that gets created. As so Pat mentioned, the full um, uh, description of this technique and analysis is available uh, in the publication in Geophysics. So the pseudo well lithology columns are generated using a continuous time Markov chain, uh, which uses the bed thickness distributions we defined previously and also the transition probabilities um, in this matrix. So these are uh, generated uh, by analysis of the, the, the fascist log and the lithology codes um, that have been mapped. Uh, so these values essentially control the probability of what lithofacies is added sequentially when each well lithofacies column is generated using the Markov chain. Um, the next to last tab is Elastic QC. So this, um, so the various plots here allow the data generated in the pseudo wells uh, to be compared to what's in the uh, input log or the real well. Um, so this can be used to check the Odyssey parameters correctly reflect the values in the selected input logs. Uh, so the QC plots are one to one ratio. Uh, so you can kind of quickly see how well the, um, the pseudo well distributions are matching the, the real uh, raw well log inputs. A uh, similar set of QC plots as histograms. Um, so this, uh, yeah, a set of QC um, histogram, so QC your distributions of porosity, bulk modulus and shear modulus between your uh, raw well and your pseudo well. Okay, so essentially we have a fully parameterized Odyssey node. Uh, ready to run through the inversion process. So all of the parameters that we've uh, input into the process so far uh, are stored in this uh, custom domain object in the input tree. So we have all our inputs, lithofacies mapping, TDR, reservoir trends, non-reservoir laminated, uh, bed thickness analysis and transitions. Um, so these are all stored in the input tree. You can have, can of course have multiple Odyssey nodes um, set up and parameterized differently. Uh, you just choose which one you want to feed into the inversion process. Okay, so the next um, part of the the Petrella implementation is to uh, use this statistics QC process. Um, so the vertical statistics stored in this particular Odyssey node uh, can be fine-tuned using this tool. So the tool is going to create a number of random pseudo wells so that the distribution of beds, fascists, prosty, nets, gross can be checked to ensure the desired range of values is covered in each macro layer. Um, so we're going to run this with uh, 500 pseudo wells. I'll click refresh. So the tool is generating in the background 500 pseudo wells for QC. 
So it's using the continuous time Markov chain, which consumes the bed thickness analysis and the transition, mat transition matrices to generate 500 lithophases columns. And then the trends, rock physics models, saturations are used to calculate a suite of statistically correct well logs against each of the 500 litho columns that is created. So in the trends tab, uh, here we have the depth um, trends for porosity, VPVS and row that we extracted earlier from the analysis of the well data. In the single tab, this shows a single QC pseudo well uh, displayed in the log tracks. So it's possible to view um, the other pseudo wells or all 500. So you can start to click back. So this is the second pseudo well, third, fourth, fifth, fifth, sixth. Uh, these aren't ranked or sorted at, at this stage. Um, so in the multi-tab, uh, this displays multiple 1D profiles um, from the QC pseudo wells to give you a broader feel of how the distributions of the litho lithophages columns look, uh, or indeed any of the other um, logs that are generated as part of this process. So in thickness results, um, so the, th the results, so for each macro layer, um, the thickness statistics generated from the pseudo wells are displayed in the table to the right, so they can be compared um, to the observed uh, thickness data on the left. Same for the transition inputs and results. So the pseudo well transition matrix on the right and the raw uh, or the real input transition matrix on the left. Uh, the last tab in this part of the process is plot results. So this has a uh, histogram uh, of the thickness uh, for each lithophages in each macro layer, along with a histogram of nets of gross, a histogram of porosity, and a histogram of porosity height. Um, so these histograms can be used to QC that you have the desired distributions of porosity and net to gross uh, represented in the pseudo wells uh, within each macro layer. So just to recap so far, we've parameterized the inputs and processes extracted the trends in the well data, analyzed the bed thickness and fascist transitions, QC'd the statistics, QC'd the statistics we have um, by using Odyssey to create a number of uh, statistically correct pseudo wells. So the next stage in the process is to actually run the full inversion process um, against a single trace location for QC. Um, so to do this, we need to input our seismic. So here we have the two um, input volumes. So our color inverted gradient and our color inverted impedance volume at 15 degrees. Uh, we have our surfaces. So again, we have um, five surfaces, which will give us our four macro layers. Um, in the contacts, uh, you specify the contacts you want to use in the inversion. And then in the inversion tab, um, the number of pseudo wells we want to create um, against each single trace to be inverted. Um, so adequate results can be found using as little as 500 pseudo wells, typically 2,000 to 3,000 are used. Um, so we're going to run with 2,000 pseudo wells. Um, so for each of the 2,000 pseudo wells that are created at each trace location, within each macro layer, the RMSE error between the seismic trace and the synthetic uh, band limited impedance is found. And this control tells Odyssey how many best match pseudo wells to average. So 30 tends to be a good default to start with. Um, sample rate, uh, we're going to run with 0 0.5 milliseconds. And then define the uh, filter frequencies. So the um, extended elastic impedance values uh, in each pseudo well are then band limited using this Ormsby filter. Um, so we're going to click refresh. So Odyssey. Um, has just created quite quickly um, 2,000 pseudo wells. So it kind of uh, used the Markov chain to create 2,000 lithophages columns, uh, then used the trends uh, extracted from the well data to, to drive the log suites, created 2,000 synthetics, and then uh, calculated the RMSE between the synthetic and this QC location, uh, which is well B. So essentially, this makes this a blind well test. Um, so if we work through the QC plots, um, so we have 
tracks average best. Um, so this is a plot of the best match 30 pseudo wells of the 2000 that were generated. Um, or the best match 30 at this QC location have been averaged uh, and are plotted to the right here. So if you look at the V shell curve, so the red track is the well log itself. Uh, and the black is the average of the best match 30 pseudo wells V shell at this location. Um, so you can see it's doing a pretty good job, uh, certainly for the most part within one standard deviation. In tracks single, um, so this shows us the best match pseudo well uh, at this particular location. So here we can click back. So this is the second best, the third best, the fourth best match pseudo wells. In multi tracks best, this shows us the best 20 litho columns. Um, or we can flip to any of the other log suites or logs available. So EEI filtered. Um, so here we can see the actual uh, seismic trace at this QC location. To the right of that, we have the 30 um, best match synthetics. And then here we have the uh, average of those 30 um, as this second trace. So you can see it's doing a pretty good job of um, approximating the seismic at this QC location. So from here, um, you kind of enter into a, an iterative process to optimize the parameterization, uh, to optimize the pseudo wells, re reduce the residual error. Um, once you've optimized the pseudo wells and get good results, um, the next stage is to run the inversion across a full inline or cross line. So to do that, we make use of um, uh, Patrol's uh, virtual seismic attributes. Um, so we're going to create a net, a prosty, and joint litho fishes probability volumes. Um, we'll just call these web and click create. So this has created um, three uh, virtual attributes hung off one of the uh, input volumes to Odyssey. So uh, to give you an idea of how quickly this runs, uh, we're going to run this as part of a demo. So I'm going to turn on uh, in this interpretation window the um, lithofishes probability cross line. Uh, so this particular cross line uh, has 250 traces across it. So starting at trace one, Odyssey creates 2,000 statistically correct pseudo wells. So 2,000 litho columns using the Markov chain, the bed thickness analysis, transition matrices. From there, 2,000 corresponding logs. Uh, or, or log suites uh, tied to the well, well data, uh, sorry, tied to the each litho fishes column. From the log suites, we get 2000 synthetics. From those, they're all compared to the seismic tr trace number one. The best 30 are selected and averaged, averaged. And then Odyssey will move on to trace number two and run the whole process completely independently from trace one. So having this kind of uh, upfront visual QC of the inversion is uh, quite a powerful and useful um, tool to have. Uh, so you can actually see some results before committing to running Odyssey uh, or running the inversion against the full volume. So it can be uh, a big time saver. So that's just, um, just let me turn off this interpolation. So here we have our, our joint lithofishes probability volume. I can also quickly quickly turn on the corresponding uh, net to gross volume. So that's kind of Odyssey inversion run across a, a QC inline or cross line. You know, again, giving you this kind of upfront QC before committing to, to running the full inversion process. So once you've happy with your QC, the final um, process in the workflow is the realization. So we just pick up our Odyssey node choose uh, how we want to run it against the whole volume or uh, a spatial region, region of interest. We can set the block size. So this is the number of traces that get realized per thread at a time. Uh, and then the number of threads you want to, to run against on your PC. Choose the volumes you want to create as output. Uh, choose the layers you want to run the inversion against. And then click Run. Um, so the process runs as a, a background task in Patrol, um, using Patrol or leaving Patrol uh, available to continue to work in while the process is running. Um, 
so here you can see from this data set, this is some uh, high net uh, sands that have been picked out from uh, this, this particular seismic data. Okay, so that kind of concludes the patrol implementation. Uh, I'm going to hand you back to Pat, uh, who's going to work, some of, work through some of the additional validation that's um, in the publication. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, right, so the uh, the big question is, uh, does it work? So BP spent quite a bit of time uh, validating uh, the algorithm um, during the R&D phase, and um, some of those validations have been published in the paper in Geophysics, and uh, this is one of them. So just let me explain what this is. Um, this column, uh, this tab here, shows the a blue line, which is the Odyssey estimation uh, of the V-shale curve at a blind well location. Uh, the track four uh, on the right, the red curve, is the blind well V-shale log. Track three to the left of that is the smoothed well V-shale curve. And track two is, is the overlay. So again, the blue is the Odyssey estimate of the V-shale value, and the red line is a smoothed well data. So you can see that the prediction is pretty good at this location. Um, it follows the line very well and almost always lies within one standard deviation um, of the estimate. This particular field, uh, which is offshore Angola, we had seven blind wells. That was one of them. And I'm now showing all seven of them. So again, you can see the blue Odyssey predictions uh, are very close to the red smoothed well log data. Um, almost throughout, um, just a few little busts here and there, but overall these results were excellent. Um, on the bottom is the cross plot of the predicted against the actual net pay values for each macro layer for each of the each of the wells. And again, you can see very good predictions. This particular field, BP tested quite a lot of inversion um, algorithms on, um, and uh, these results were by far the best um, we obtained. This slide shows the, uh, what happens as you change the number of pseudo wells per trace. So the panel on the bottom there from the left hand side shows the result of just using 200 pseudo wells and then increasing from 500, 1000, 2000 through to 5000 on the right hand side. So you can see on the left that the, the thinner macro layers, so there's one at the top which is a sheet sand. The Odyssey did a pretty good job of characterizing that with just 200 pseudo wells, and the results don't change all that much as you go to higher numbers. But the thick channel sands in the middle, um, you can see a lot of vertical stripes running through that, um, which show that the results have not stabilized for uh, this small pseudo well count. Um, it didn't find enough matches of good quality. Uh, so in this case, increasing the number of pseudo wells, certainly at least 2,000. Um, Im improves the results, and even 5,000 is, is better still. What we're aiming for here is, is to obtain the same degree of continuity on the output as we had on the input seismic data. If we can do that, then it demonstrates the, uh, the algorithm is stable. <clears throat> and the fact that the algorithm is purely one-dimensional, we're not applying any spatial lateral uh, continuity or smoothing to the results, um, means we're able to QC the quality, the stability of the algorithm this way. Once we've achieved um, continuity equal to the continuity input, we know we have stable results. Uh, and this is a very important uh, feature of the, uh, of, of the process. Uh, the process uh, lends itself to simultaneous inversion. Uh, the result that Mark showed was simultaneous inversion. Um, this is uh, example applied to the Shehalian field in the west of Shetland. Um, here the data quality is somewhat less than the data quality offshore Angola. Uh, we can see in the middle of, the, of this section there's an oil water contact. Above the contact the full stack colored inversion uh, provides good definition of the sand bodies. But below the contact where the impedance uh, contrasts are smaller uh, for a full stack we need to go to a gradient colored inversion uh, to define the brine sands. So the way the Method, the process works is by generating the same number of pseudo wells, but for each pseudo well we now generate uh, two synthetics corresponding to the two different chi angles of the input seismic data. 
Uh, the, each synthetic is matched to its corresponding seismic data set, and the matching metrics are combined together, and we then select the 30 which provide the best match to both, uh, both volumes and, and uh, output those. And as you can see, the result of that process, we, we get a, a very good definition of the sand bodies, both above and below the contact. Odyssey makes no use of a low-frequency model. Instead, the low frequencies are implicitly constrained by the geological parameterization. And to illustrate what I mean by that, um, I've, I've shown a, an example, a model of a thick reservoir section. So between 400 and 500 milliseconds two-way time, there's a reservoir. Uh, the left-hand panel shows a low net to gross realization, on the right, a high net to gross. And uh, for each, I've, I show a lift column, then a corresponding uh, impedance log, which I've just generated using a very simplistic binary impedance model. And then the right-hand side, right-hand of each panel, uh, show the sub-seismic frequencies. So the frequency component that lies below the seismic bandwidth, so typically maybe up to, say, 8 or 10 hertz. And the thing to notice, of course, is that the, the low frequency component for a thick reservoir like this depends in, entirely on the reservoir parameters, the net to gross, which is typically the thing we're trying to estimate. Um, so this highlights the risk of using low frequency models. If we use the low frequency model, we'd have to choose one of these um, to uh, combine with our seismic data, which would inevitably bias the results. In the case of Odyssey, though, what we do is, is we input any prior knowledge we have about the reservoir on the range of net to grosses. So if, for example, we know that the net to gross is, is nearly always uh, above 50%, then we'd that would effectively or implicitly constrain our low frequencies to being panels two or three. Um, so we, there is still uncertainty, which is appropriate for the, for the low frequencies, um, but we haven't left it wide open. In some situations, we may know nothing about the range of net to gross expected, in which case the uncertainty uh, of the sub-seismic component may be quite large. And that is correct. It just represents the uncertainty we have of those very low frequencies and will be represented in the uncertainty in the, uh, in the output of our estimates. Uh, so Odyssey does not impose any lateral continuity on the results. Every trace is independent of every other. So we, do, we make no use of any geostatistical model in the process. Um, our view on that is, is that uh, within the seismic bandwidth, overriding our beautiful seismic image, shown, for example, on the top right, by ge geostatistical simulation is not appropriate. Uh, we should you know, not override data with a model. Um, so for the seismic inversion process itself, there's no need to invoke any geostatistics. If we're going on to generate a reservoir model, we may require that to be built at a resolution greater than that provided by the seismic data, in which case we will need to add some additional high frequencies. And to do that, we will need to constrain those high frequencies using uh, a geostatistical model. But that process can be done sequentially after the inversion process. There's no need to uh, combine that within the inversion. Um, it, uh, it just makes the, the whole process unnecessarily uh, complicated. And also, it reduces the, uh, our ability to quality control the output of the inversion. So our belief is to separate geostatistics from inversion. Transparency is a, is a key feature of the process. Um, at any one location, it's possible to um, output and inspect the best match pseudo wells, which were averaged to produce that particular output. So if you're interested in how some result was obtained, um, you can go back and output the best match pseudo wells at that location and see exactly what was going on uh, to produce that result. Uh, and if you don't like the result, um, perhaps it's because of the way the pseudo wells were parameterized, you can then go back and adjust the parameterization of the pseudo wells uh, to obtain a, a result um, that um, is more to your liking. Um, so there is no complicated algorithm involved in, in this process. There is clearly a lot of uh, computation going on, um, but, the, but the overall process is conceptually simple and easy to understand. It's merely the, the process of, of generating lots of pseudo wells, you know, matching them to the seismic, picking out the ones which match best, and averaging um, the properties associated with them to come up with an estimate. And finally, some numbers. Um, some of you may be maybe doing some uh, mental arithmetic on the numbers involved here. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, my reservoir is covered by about a 1,000 seismic traces, and um, you want to generate 2,000 pseudo-wells for each one of those. So we're up to 2 billion pseudo-wells. 
and each one of those pseudo wells comprises 17 petrophysical curves, so we're generating 34 billion petrophysical curves to do the inversion, and on top of that we're tying all of that to the stratigraphy and matching it to the seismic. Um, so you may be wondering if you're going to get any results before next year. Um, and certainly the, uh, the, the prototype version that I wrote in MATLAB was pretty slow. Um, but um, the, the clever programmers here at Seagal have done a fantastic job to improve the efficiency of the algorithm dramatically. And uh, we're now able to carry out that exact operation outlined there in less than eight hours on just a standard Petrel Windows workstation, the type you had up under your desk. And as uh, Mark demonstrated, 2D test lines can be um, inverted in, in less than a minute. Um, so you can do comprehensive testing on test lines you know, in a matter of hours and then set the job up to run either on the largest reservoir or run overnight and you'll have the results in the morning. So I think this is a highly practical and efficient implementation uh, of the algorithm. Uh, so in summary, Odyssey uh, represents a new approach to seismic inversion. It's a 1D joint simultaneous inversion algorithm that directly estimates reservoir properties. It's a rigorous method based on sampling the prior that uh, captures the uncertainties of the process. It produces high quality results that have been validated now on many fields. It's a conceptually simple, transparent process, and all the details have now been published in the current edition of Geophysics. The process is efficient and the run times are very manageable. So I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll hand back to Mark now. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, so we'll open up for uh, some Q&A. Uh, if you want to, if you have any questions, please uh, input them into the question dialogue, which is part of the GoToMeeting uh, panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so just while you uh, pass over any questions you may have, uh, just to let you know that Odyssey is available for evaluation now. Um, it's up on the Ocean Store. Um, so if you go to ocean.slb.com, uh, you can get access to the plugin, or please uh, get in contact with your Segal account manager, um, or email us on sales.geo at segal.com. Okay, um, so we have a question here about carbonate reservoirs. Um, so currently we have not implemented carbonates um, uh, within, uh, within the, uh, uh, the software. It's certainly within our plans. Uh, we always knew we were going to need to do that and uh, I'm, I think in a future release we will certainly implement carbonates, but as of yet it's not currently available. Uh, I've got a question about uh, is there any way to adapt the algorithm using a, using a Python tool? Uh, currently, I don't believe there is. Um, that was something we can bear in mind, but uh, it's not not available at the moment. Okay, uh, so just to add that we have um, the plugin supported on uh, Patrol 2014 and 15 at the moment. Um, we're also representing this at EAGE, um, if you're coming along to Vienna. Uh, then Pat will be on the booth um, on the Tuesday um, to sort of, we're making a bit of a splash with Odyssey. So if you're at uh, EAGE in Vienna, please come along and see us. Okay, we've got one more question. Um, how would you recommend using the results of this process of seismic control and geostatistical reservoir modeling? Um, we haven't really worked out the details of, of the work, optimal workflow for that. We did a few test examples in BP, but um, as of yet, I think most of that really kind of still sits within R&D, the best way of doing it. I mean, the idea really would be to, we, now that you have a mean and a standard deviation of a reservoir property, um, that that in principle could be used to constrain the geostatistical modeling. So you, know, you finish up with results um, which are um, entirely consistent with the seismic data. So everything sits within the error bars, but it's not unduly constrained by the seismic data. Um, it recognizes the uncertainty of the estimate. So at the moment, that's somewhat conceptual. We haven't worked through the details, something we plan to do in the future, though. 
Uh, for noisy data, have you considered implementing any 3D continuity controls? No, we haven't. Um, it, it's something we really sort of think is, uh, uh, is it should be a separate process. So we really want to, I think it's a question of, you know, optimizing the seismic data in advance uh, as best we possibly can. And then really the, the, the idea of the inversion is just to maintain the degree of continuity that um, is, is present in the seismic data. And if it is noisy and discontinuous, that will be represented in the output. And you could then potentially um, uh, imp impose some geostatistics um, as, a, as a subsequent step, I think. Um, and it's got, are there stratigraphic rules for the pseudo wells? Um, not, no, I mean, I think it just ties into your interpretation. So um, at the moment, you, you're free to interpret as you, as you wish. Uh, and the, that will define the macro layers. Um, so it doesn't do anything more than, than makes use of the interpretation um, as uh, provided by the interpreter. Um, right. Yeah, it's probably enough, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I think we'll um, just uh, call it a day there, um, if that's okay. We've got a list of all the questions that have come in, so if we haven't got back to any of them, uh, we've got it all documented, so and we have everybody's email address, so we can uh, we'll follow up with everybody uh, personally over the next couple of days. Um, okay, so I guess it just remains to say uh, thank you very much for your participation today. Um, just remind you that this webinar has been recorded. You'll all receive an email uh, with a link to the recording uh, tomorrow. Please feel free to distribute that as you require, um, or you can watch it again at your leisure. Um, okay, so thank you very much for your participation and uh, goodbye for now.